Hi. Hello. Hi. Hi, Frank. Uh, this is Arthur. A call from Seattle, and um, I've had a question that's been up on the Eucadia forum for a little while, and I <clears throat> I haven't been able to find anything in the material about it, so I figured I'd call you and give you a shot. Um, and I just want you to know that I'm coming from a place of really wanting Eucadia to succeed, like really. <laughs> <laughs> like very, very much so. So when I ask this question, I just want you to know that's the intent behind it. Sure, there is. Um, does Eucadia have provisions within it for determining what the relationship would be or will be should it consume the Roman system and then societies that were within the Roman system choose not to adopt Eucadia? That's a very, very good question. There are, but I don't believe it's clear enough. And, and I'll, let, me, let me add to that and thank you for your question. When the canons were written, these are the canons of law, and I'm using this as an example just to show that there's more work to be done. They were written as a part exposure, as maxims and as expression of some of the arguments that go to those. In actual fact, that's a mixture of things that really depreciate the importance and the value of many of the, many of the cans and many of the knowledge that's there. And the reason is that if you write something as if you're in the middle of competition and if you're going to court, if you're going facing prison, if your home is facing foreclosure, it's very hard to think in terms of 50 years ahead, 100 years ahead, or 500 years ahead. But if those canons are going to stand the test of time, then they have to be more than, better than, rise above the kind of petty battle between whether the Roman cult will be here in another 50 years. So there's a lot more work to do. The provisions are there in the charters and covenant, yes, but I don't believe it is clear enough and I don't think the approach yet is at the level that it needs to be. So it's a good question, an excellent question. Okay, thanks. And could you just kind of allude to what that relationship would be if, if say, the Iroquois nation who is right now fully functional even within, within the Roman system, which is, you know, fought tooth and nail against, you know, oppression and and all kinds of obstacles and pressure to to give up its its current system of governance. Um, what would the relationship be? Is it too is it too complex to get into? Can you point me to an area no, no, where no, I can read no, about no, that? No, I don't think. I think if something's complex, then then usually it's trying to hide something, isn't it? Or, right. Or it hasn't right. been thought through. Um, I, I would say simply that. A, a society, strictly speaking, a society needs to be uh, three or more people, or something larger than a family. So we would define, certainly in the, in the way that uh, we're defining mystery of law, that society is regarded as as a minimum aggregate, and and right. it would only be a handful of, of of living men and women. But the argument is that any group can choose their law form, and that group law providing, well, not even qualifying, that, that law needs to be respected um, within, and I say, I'm trying, trying not to qualify, but you understand that people may choose to live in a cult. Right. Um, so right. There is, I mean, there is, it, it seems like yeah. there should be some basics, like if you have a cult that sacrifices children, well, that's not that's not something that's allowed. But then again, that gets a little complicated because it, there's it there's does. this degree thing, you know. Yeah, but the principle. Let me talk about the principle, and then we'll, we'll move on. Hopefully, this answer for you. The principle is when an association chooses to live according to their own rules, providing those rules recognise some essential essential principles of life, that's all, just basic principles, Right. then that law should be respected and it will be recognised by Eucadia. Yes, that's the short, simple answer. Okay. Okay, gotcha. Appreciate it. No, thank you. Thank you very much. 
All right. Thank you for the question. Uh, Frank, from the uh, chat, we'll go to a few questions over there. Uh, we're waiting on some more folks if they've got any questions on the phone line. Um, when we were talking about the uh, person and title in the court, someone brought up, uh, and we, we were talking about the joinder there. Um, would that be one of the first questions that should be asked of the court if they if they um, have a joinder and if uh, they should and require them to produce a joinder or or the evidence of a joinder? Yeah, well, you know, you, you know, when you look at a charge sheet or any kind of indictment that they will say Franco Collins, also known as F.O. Collins, also known as. So you see in their own material that they ensure that all aliases are enjoined to the person, yeah? All you have um, to do. For the most part, that, if they can find a, uh, any kind of contract or nexus with the state, yeah, they'll try to draw in any of those aliases or any of those uh, possibilities there. I, I I now see the importance um, in recognising the court's desire to try and establish an enjoinder if other titles are presented. And that is something that at least at the low intellect of these people now that they have been trained to do. In other words, they, they, they know this idea of contracting. In other words, if you agree, they can proceed. It, it mitigates it mitigates everything else so long as you don't consent and you identify that you have other titles belonging to a separate society for which they do not have jurisdiction then they can't proceed with the matter without separating what their person their title from your person and because you don't consent then they're an impasse because if they do proceed on the false premise of an enjoinder when none exist, then they're in fact breaking, well, every law in the books. Hmm. Does that make yes. sense? Well, that would be one of the, the basics, I guess, would be that and the, um, uh, the proof of subject matter or, or personam jurisdiction at that point. Well, yeah, on, on subject matter, I, I want to qualify this, and this is something that you will see corrected in the notes. I mean, we're, we're constantly finding information coming through, and it's fantastic time, but it's also frustrating to get it all ready. Subject matter jurisdiction is one that has been deliberately vague in their system. And, and, and what we've discovered is that if you look at the three areas, personal relates to custodianship, territorial uh, relates to the role of the executor and subject matter relates to the guardian. So they're the tribunal of powers that they've been brought against you through the um, person being the clerk, the um, territorial being the uh, protonotary and the subject matter being the plenipotentiary but then the prosecutor. Subject matter actually should be, should be read as um, matter of subjects and it is not the topic is merely that they are claiming a guardianship power over you so in all three jurisdictions just so I'm absolutely clear when you go to court they already believe they have jurisdiction over you they've already perfected jurisdiction over you the argument of, of arguing jurisdiction is only if you can produce a mistake so challenging jurisdiction has no effect. It's only if you immediately bring a mistake to their to their attention that tells them that they do not have one of those or all of those three powers. And this is another reason for title and another reason for belonging to a separate society. Mm, that's very very good clarity there. That that uh, should help a lot. All right. Next question: Does sacrament of penance apply to civil and criminal courts? And if so, are they expressed differently to fit the venue? Great question. Okay. It applies to all court. The sacrament of penance is necessary to perfect a negotiable instrument being an indulgence. Therefore, the sacrament of penance 
in some stripped down version is present in the preparation of all negotiable instruments in their system on the public side. The private is hidden, the ecclesiastical ritual is hidden, but it is present in all form. Now in the case of a criminal charge, there are three acts that you must go through, three acts of the play. The first act, it is the pro se cutis, uh, on behalf of my own flesh that is accusing you. The second act is when you perfect jurisdiction and you plea then the judge becomes the executor for the second act, which is a confession. And the third act, you agree to the sentence and you become the executor in the third act. So it's perfected. In a civil matter, it is through the sacrament of marriage. And this may sound odd, but the sacrament of marriage, which is underpinning every contract of goods under the Roman system, because the sacrament of marriage is one of the guardian and the femme convert. Think of the rights of a female, uh, of the feminine 200 years ago. They had no rights. And this is why the Roman cult says that a marriage, a union, is always between a man and a woman. So when you um, have a mortgage, you have a credit card, you have a car, when you apply, when you fill in an application, then effectively what you're doing is creating a dowry and an identity to the other party and making them the guardian. You are nominating yourself to be the femme cover in, in a legal sense. So under a civil matter, the first part of the sacrament is the guardian confessing on your behalf, so the plaintiff. The second act is the judge then becoming the executor, which is fine, and the third act is you agreeing to the sentence. So that's the difference. Is in the first act in criminal, it is the prosecutus, in the civil, it is the plaintiff in the role of guardian. All right? Yes, thank you for that, Frank. That was very, very good and an excellent question. All right, uh, next question. Uh, the EDP not being done, what's an appropriate response to decline an offer of jury summons? And in general, would you, for filling out the forms and the signature, is the BC uh, dot 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 appropriate? Absolutely, it's appropriate. Uh, jury summons, um, there are already valid um, remedy within a jury summons to, to non attendance. There may be some variance in your own state or province, wherever you live, but effectively, um, if you are unable to attend and don't, I mean, it's not a question of don't wish, but if, if it's a matter of um, religious or conscience, then you can state those and make it clear that there is no need to introduce any material that we're describing into responding to a jury summons. Within their system, there is already plenty of, of history and valid response to non-attendance. So I would just simply look up the... Um, the uh, the instruction that goes with it and follow the most appropriate response that they give you in the system. I don't think you need to go beyond that at all. Yes, that's very good. All right, back to the phones. We have uh, Ron. Ron is first. Are you there, Ron? Hi, Ron. Terry. Hi, Frank. Oh, hi, hi Ron. Hi. hi there. Yes. Um, Last month, I, I had to renew my driver's license in the state of Washington, and they had changed the policy about putting any identifiers before or after the signature. So what they did was if you, if you put anything in the front, they would tear it up and you'd have to sign it again, right? Then they said, well, if you want to, you can put it, Underneath the signature, whatever you want to write. Well, I did that, and I get my driver's license back, and it's completely gone. <laughs> they masked it out when they produced the uh, the the card, the driver's license. Classic. Yeah, classic. They're they're on to it, and and they're also doing facial recognition uh, software pictures now. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a it's a classic. Look, um, 